Um, well, I'm Dr. Victoria Sampson, um, and today I've been invited to talk to you about oral hygiene um, and the relationship with COVID-19 complications. So um, a little bit of background knowledge about me. Um, I'm a general dentist based in London, UK. I currently work part-time privately and also part-time NHS. Um, and I've always been incredibly passionate about research. Um, I started doing research as young as my second year of university. Um, and I've published numerous papers, both um, in England and also internationally. Um, and then I also have just most, most recently gone on to win Best Young Dentist of the Year from the British Endodontic Society for research that I performed with Health Education England, and also an award from the British Society of Dental Maxillofacial Radiology, again, for some more research that I performed. So um, I'm also, uh, I work with EMS as well as a GBT ambassador or a guided biofilm therapy ambassador. Um, and I was lucky enough to be invited to learn more about GBT last year and really fell in love with the company and their products. So what have I been invited to talk to you about today? Um, in April, I published an article in the British Dental Journal arguing that oral hygiene should be deemed a risk factor for developing complications from COVID-19. And given how time sensitive um, research is uh, currently, we've tried to publish as soon as possible. So we published a mini article, which is this one here. Um, and then we've also got a much larger paper, which is over 3000 words long. <clears throat> and that's in the process of being published right now in the British Dental Journal too. Um, and I work very closely with a fantastic nutritionist, uh, Ms. Noir Kamona, uh, who really assisted me as well with a lot of the inflammatory pathways. Uh, following the publication of this mini article, it blew up overnight. Hundreds of people were tweeting about it um, and it reached an estimated 45,000 people overnight. And then just on Twitter alone, also 200 reposts on Instagram again overnight. Um, and now the letter is the most cited and viewed article within that edition of the British Dental Journal, um, and also in the top 5% of all research outputs ever tracked by Altmetric. Now, why is this important? As dentists or uh, members of the dental industry, we need to explain to our patients uh, that oral health is directly correlated to the rest of our body. And whilst we're seeing a shift in people's um, kind of ideas of health due, due to this pandemic, we need to convince them to also make sh that shift with their oral health. So this is not the time to abandon your dental checkup, to you know, forget to brush your teeth, to forget to floss, or to be too scared to come to the dentist. It's the time to take care of your mouth more so now than ever. Um, and so this talk is basically going to be showing kind of the research and the evidence that um, links oral health and the oral microbiome to COVID-19 complications. Um, and throughout this whole uh, presentation, I've put little QR codes on the bottom of most of my pages. And so what you can do is if you want to learn more about that research or that article that I'm talking about, all you have to do is you just need to get your camera and then you have to scan the QR code and it will automatically take you to the paper that I'm talking about. So if you want to test it out, this is a link to my article that was published a few weeks ago. So I'll give you a couple of seconds or so to try out if you want. And again, you can use it for any of the articles later on as well. So post dentistry post COVID-19. So what I'm going to be talking to you about is the connection between oral hygiene and the severity of COVID-19 infections. As a UK dentist, I put my birth to rest in mid-March, and since then I've been working on an on-call basis for my dental practices. Um, I've also been redeployed to help with the COVID-19 front, um, and I'm now a clinical advisor for the NHS as well. Similar to many of you, I'm sure, I became slightly obsessive over COVID-19 and researched it extensively. I wanted to know what it was, how it infected humans, where it came from, who was at risk, and as a dentist, how oral hygiene could potentially have an impact on it. Many of you are probably very concerned about how COVID-19 is going to impact our world when our doors open. PPE questions aside, are there going to be more or less patients? Are they going to be scared of coming to the dentist or will they be more motivated to take care of their health? And lastly, will there be less aesthetic work due to financial constraints or more because we're constantly on Zoom like we are right now? So what the, this is a list of what we're going to be really covering today. 
and hopefully this will give you some assurance when you go back to work and some motivation to really inspire your patients. I'm going to be covering the research that I've already performed and the paper that I publish and also the research that I'm currently in the process of performing um, in the largest study in the world uh, with oral microbiome and COVID-19 with the help of UCL Eastman Institute, Whittington Hospital Trust, and also UCL Hospital Trust. So we're going to be talking about what is COVID-19, the risk factors for developing COVID-19, the causes of a severe COVID-19 infection, and does bacteria play a role in COVID-19? And do COVID-19 patients suffer from a bacterial superinfection? And is there any relationship or connection between the oral microbiome and COVID-19 complications? And if so, uh, is there any link between oral health and COVID-19 complications? And what can we as clinicians or the dental profession advise our patients to reduce their risk of COVID-19 complications? So we'll start with just learning a little bit about COVID-19. So on December the 31st, 2019, the World Health Organization was informed of a cluster of 27 cases of pneumonia with no known cause. And it was linked to a wet animal wholesale market in Wuhan city, China. The causative virus was then shown to be a member of the coronavirus family and was called SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. On December the, uh, sorry. Uh, so let's meet SARS-CoV-2's family. Prior to the discovery of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, six coronaviruses were known to cause human disease. Four viruses are prevalent and cause common cold symptoms. You've probably never even heard of these names before, but these are the ones here. Um, and then there are two other strains, which are the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or SARS, um, and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or MERS. And these are both very fatal, and I'm sure you've heard about them in, um, when the outbreak in 2004. And uh, now SARS-CoV-2, or COVID-19, has become the seventh member of the family of the coronaviruses that infect humans. Now, the reason that this is so important, and I wanted to shed some light on this, is because SARS-CoV-2 is, is the sister or the brother of the other strains. And so what we've seen with the metagenome is that SARS-CoV-2 is 85% similar to um, SARS and MERS, especially SARS. So that means that you know, we're, we're handling a new virus that we've never seen before. However, we know a lot about their family and we, you know, we're at a stage where we cannot perform all the research that we want to because we're against time. So it's really important to look back at research that's already been performed and to try and see, and, and you know, 85% of the time, you'll probably have something quite useful from looking at previous research. So let's look at the risk factors. COVID-19 can present with mild, moderate, or severe illness. And the risk factors will dictate how quickly we get ill, um, whether we get ill, what complications we get, and how likely we are to die from COVID-19. And these were first highlighted by Zhu et al. in 2020 in the largest retrospective cohort. And the risk factors included age, the average age of the patients who died were 69 years old, gender, 70% of the patients, again, who died were male, and an underlying comorbidity in 48% of cases. And the highest uh, kind of comorbidities were hypertension, which was 30%, diabetes, 19%, heart disease, 8%. And then new research came from France relatively recently, and that was with the idea that obesity was also a huge risk factor, and that 47.6% of patients who died were also um, obese as well. And so that could also start to show why um, younger patients are starting to, to have severe complications and to actually die from COVID-19. And then one more risk factor was added um, relatively recently, and that was uh, race. And interestingly, the Office for National Statistics from the UK showed that um, the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups were nearly four times more likely to die from COVID-19. And that's huge to think that is four times more likely. So the complications that I keep on talking about, the main complications are pneumonia, sepsis, septic shock, and acute respiratory distress syndrome, also known as ARDS. And when pneumonia spreads to the lungs and the blood oxygen levels fall, patients require assisted ventilation. And that's when their diagnosis shifts from pneumonia to acute respiratory distress syndrome. And ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome, is the primary cause of death in COVID-19 patients. Um, and 
over 52.4% of them died due to respiratory failure. And it's expected that we at all point, at some point, will have a COVID-19 infection, in my opinion. I think we all will have to have one, whether we know about it or not. But a big focus of research at the moment is what differentiates one person from another. Why will some people be completely asymptomatic or only lose their smell, while others will develop serious complications and die? So back to those risk factors again, and these risk factors that we've, we've talked about, they shed a lot of light, but in my opinion, they just don't really explain why 52% of the deaths um, related to COVID-19 are in patients who have none of these risk factors and are completely healthy. And in my opinion, you know, if, if COVID-19 is meant to impact the immune system so severely, uh, why is it that patients who are immunocompromised, uh, so for example, patients who are on chemotherapy um, or patients who are taking immunosuppressive drugs, not statistically more likely to have complications from COVID-19? And on top of that as well, if we remember that COVID-19 is a respiratory disease, why is it that you know, smokers or asthmatics are not more likely to have a respiratory viral disease and with all other respiratory diseases we know that smokers and asthmatics are always more likely to develop complications so why is COVID-19 different and new research from UCL last week has actually shown the opposite that somehow smoking could be potentially protective against COVID-19 complications and from all hospitalized patients only five percent of them were smokers and bearing in mind in the United Kingdom 15% of our population are smokers. So that means that there's an abnormally low level of smokers in, um, who are hospitalized. So what do these comor comorbidities such as you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, what do they all have in common? One thing that struck out to me as a dentist was altered oral microbiome. When a patient with any of these comorbidities comes to my dental chair, I know that they will have altered levels and types of oral bacteria in their mouth. And it makes them more susceptible to, to dry mouth or xerostomia and also gum disease or periodontitis. And following this lightning moment uh, at my dinner table during quarantine, I set on to investigate the impact of bacteria on COVID-19 complications, and more specifically oral bacteria um, and the connection with the lower respiratory tract during COVID-19. We know that there's a strong connection between viral infections and bacterial superinfections. So why is COVID-19 or why would COVID-19 be any different? So the paper that we wrote, as well as the research that we are now conducting, aims to hopefully add oral microbiome or oral bacterial load as um, another risk factor. And the next few slides will explain why. So number one, bacterial superinfections. It is very common, as I said, for bacterial superinfections to occur during any viral infection. And we saw this with the influenza outbreak in 1918, where even though the causative organism was a virus, the most common cause of death from this viral infection was a bacterial superinfection. And then we saw exactly the same thing with the H1N1 influenza outbreak in 2009, where again, it was a viral infection, but the main cause of death was a bacterial superinfection. And we're seeing a very similar trend with this pandemic too. So this paper um, that I'm showing you here by Cox, um, it was published in April uh, in The Lancet and it's co-infections potentially lethal and unexplored in COVID-19. And the statistics basically show that over 50% of severe COVID-19 patients had secondary bacterial infections when they died. And on top of that, over 71% of patients who were admitted into hospital, and these are mild, moderate, or severe patients, required antibiotics upon admission. And then the severe patients, 74.5% of them who were admitted to ICU needed antibiotics. And not just you know, preventative or prophylactic antibiotics, but antibiotics to treat a bacterial super infection. And the reason that it could be that is because when a viral infection occurs, the immune system is essentially preoccupied. And this allows for bacterial overgrowth and bacterial superinfections. And this will lead to increased severity and mortality because our bodies quite literally just can't take it anymore. And one, the, another thing that this paper shows as well is that you know, it, it highlights the importance of bacterial superinfections in COVID-19, um, but also it, it shows that bacterial superinfections in any viral you know, respiratory outbreak is always understudied. And it's usually because 
viral respiratory outbreaks happen very suddenly and they take the, the scientific world by storm. And the, the last thing people are thinking about is looking at the bacterial side of things in a viral infection. They're all looking at cures and you know, vaccinations and, and immune therapy, but they're not necessarily thinking about how bacteria could impact that. And also on top of that, it's very difficult to diagnose a bacterial superinfection in a patient who's infected with a virus. So another fantastic paper um, by Zheng et al. did, uh, it also continues to really drive home this idea of a bacterial superinfection. And he did an excellent comparison of patients who were moderately infected with COVID-19 versus patients who were severely infected. And what he found was that um, there is lymphocyte exhaustion and bacterial superinfection. So what does that mean? If we look at this, this graph here and, and what he was talking about, he basically found that patients suffering from severe infections had a remarkably higher number of neutrophils and a remarkably lower level of lymphocytes. And neutrophils are our bacterial fighters. So they had really high levels of the bacterial fighters in severe cases of COVID-19 and really low levels of the viral fighters, which are our lymphocytes in, again, the severe cases. And so this is really abnormal for a viral infection to have such a high number of neutrophils or the bacterial fighters, but very common for a bacterial infection. And this could indicate there's two kind of reasons that this can happen. Either the lymphocytes are functionally exhausted in severe um, cases of COVID-19. And after a while, they say, you know what, I'm, I'm tired, I'm done. And they start to deplete in levels. And, and that's what happens. Or the other idea is this idea that in, in there's at some point that bacteria is introduced and the body shifts all of its energy into fighting a bacterial superinfection as opposed to the pre-existing viral infection. And what it's really important to realize and remember is that all of these severe patients were once moderate or mild. So at one stage in the, in the development of their disease, they, they did have normal levels of lymphocytes and neutrophils. So they had low neutrophils and high lymphocytes, which is indicative of a viral infection. But something happens, which all of a sudden shifts their immune system and changes their levels, which then moves into a really high level of neutrophils and low levels of lymphocytes. And in my opinion, it's bacteria. And this is really similar. I wanna draw, you know, draw a comparison to HIV or AIDS. Um, and the only reason I'm drawing this comparison is because HIV is a viral infection and at normal or a mild or moderate HIV um, patients, they have normal levels of lymphocytes um, and they also have normal CD4 counts. But in the severe cases of HIV, um, it, they, their CD4 count and their number of lymphocytes depletes and it goes really, really low. And that's when the diagnosis shifts from HIV to AIDS. And patients who have HIV or AIDS they don't die from HIV, they die from super infections. So the main cause of death in HIV patients is tuberculosis, which is a bacterial infection, or they have you know, numerous fungal infections. And as a dentist, you know, there's so many um, oral implications of HIV patients, which are all bacterial or fungal, they're not viral. And so what I really wanna drive home here is the idea that you know, we've got a virus, it reduces your immune system and allows for bacterial super infections, and that's what usually causes the complications. So this another paper um, here, it, it really supports this. And it's, by, it's a paper by Leo et al. called Neutrophil to Lymphocyte Ratio Predicts Severe Illness in COVID-19. And what it shows again is that when lymphocyte levels reduce, severity increases. And the ratio of neutrophils to lymphocytes can be a very good indicator of whether or not a COVID-19 patient is going to go to is going to become a severe patient and what they found as well is that um, over 80 percent of those severe COVID-19 patients had exceptionally high bacterial load and again over 80 percent of them also required antibiotics to treat bacterial super infections. Now talking about these antibiotics so much there's a lot of studies which are looking at the combination of using an antibiotic with an antiviral and the, um, the antibiotic that they're usually using is, a, is azithromycin, and the antiviral um, is hydroxychloroquine. And so basically, there's a lot of developing research, which originated in France by um, Gautreau et al. This was about in April time, maybe late March. 
Um, and what they showed was that a combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin cured 100% of patients virologically after six days. And you can see it in this graph here. And then if they just had hydroxychloroquine, so they didn't have the antibiotic, then only 57.1% of those patients were cured after six days. And then if they were the controls, so they didn't have hydroxychloroquine and they didn't have um, azithromycin, then only 12.5% of them were uh, cured virologically after six days. And what this shows is that, you know, biologic bacteria must be playing a very important role because the only difference between a 57.1% success rate and a 100% success rate was the addition of an antibiotic. Now, the idea of using hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin has come under a lot of dispute recently in the news. And I'm sure a lot of you are shaking your heads and saying, oh, no, she's talking about this. And it, the reason why is because a lot of people say that it, it may not be effective, that it's dangerous, whilst others are saying that actually this could be our lifeline. A lot of the controversy stemmed from this paper in particular because it was, um, it was a very small sample size. So they only did this on 50 patients. And it was non-randomized, meaning that information was omitted and there could have been an element of bias in there. And so personally, for me, I was on the fence about including this in my research and obviously also presenting it to you guys too. However, more research came out on the 5th of May, so last week, and that for me really solidified it. And it showed that in a retrospective report of 1,061 patients who were COVID-19 positive, 91.7% of them were virologically cured within 10 days when put on a combination of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. And this isn't the first time that we've used antibiotics prophylactically for a viral infection. We use them for influenza, for Zika virus, for HIV, and the list goes on. And so the idea of adding an, uh, an antibiotic is a very plausible treatment option and a good way of preventing um, a mild case of COVID-19 developing into a severe case. Now, I'm not here to talk to you about which treatments I think will be effective. And quite frankly, I'm not in a position to tell you that. But what I do want to stress is that the addition of an antibiotic statistically has shown a huge advantage in treatment outcomes. And that bacteria clearly does play a very important role in COVID-19 complications. So we know now that you know, their bacteria is playing an important role in predicting the severity of COVID-19. But why oral bacteria? So there's constant immigration and elimination of bacteria between the oral cavity and the lungs. So we're constantly, we're breathing in, we're having bacteria going between, there's a huge um, exchange between the lungs and the mouth. And usually that's fine, it's healthy, it's good, it's normal. Um, however, if we have poor oral health or a bacterial overgrowth in the mouth, then there's a very high risk of inhaling these oral secretions and contaminating the lower respiratory tract. So when we are healthy, our immune systems are able to fight this and, you know, it's fine. But when we are ill or if we are busy fighting a viral infection such as COVID-19, bacterial super infections become very common in the lower respiratory tract and it causes complications exactly like pneumonia or acute respiratory distress syndrome. And the diagram above, it, the diagram here, it shows exactly how oral bacteria can contribute to a respiratory infection. And the main mechanism of oral bacteria entering the respiratory tracts are highlighted here. So firstly, you could just inhale oral bacteria um, and it just goes to the lungs. So it's pretty easy, that one. And uh, the second idea is that if you have periodontal disease, then the enzymes that are released um, from the periodontal disease and the bacteria associated with the disease can actually alter the oral mucosa. And this will allow for uh, the mucosa to kind of become like sticky and it allows for respiratory pathogens to adhere and to also grow and colonize. And then the last idea is that actually the respiratory epithelium, so not the oral mucosa, the respiratory epithelium can be altered as well by those exact same periodontal enzymes and also by the cytokines. And again, it makes it a little bit more sticky and it promotes the infection by any respiratory pathogens. So, if we look here, um, we rewind back to the risk factors which were associated with COVID-19, which were age, gender, obesity, comorbidities. Then we start to see that the comorbidities highlighted as risk factors are also heavily implicated in imbalances in the oral microbiome. And this is where we tie everything together. And this is hopefully where you should have your eureka moment 
So diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, they're all associated with very high numbers of Fusobacterium nucleatum, Prevotella intermedia, and Porphyromonas gingivalis. And these are all commensal oral bacteria in the mouth. And however, at high levels, they can be implicated in the progression of periodontal disease. And what we see with all of these comorbidities is that actually patients are at a very high risk of periodontal disease or vice versa. So um, patients with periodontal disease are at a 25% increased risk of cardiovascular disease, three times the risk of diabetes, 20% increased risk of hypertension, and three times the risk of obesity. So furthermore, you know, periodontal disease is shown to cause systemic inflammation. Um, and it produces very high levels of certain inflammatory markers, which are interleukin 2, 6, and 10. And these are exactly the same inflammatory markers that are heightened in COVID-19. And we know that COVID-19 also causes systemic inflammation. So the idea of periodontal disease and, and um, increased risk of respiratory infections has also already been studied long before COVID-19 came. In a study of 49,000 patients with chronic periodontitis, um, they treated these patients with periodontal therapy over 12 years. And those patients who had the periodontal therapy were at a statistically significant um, reduced risk of contracting pneumonia. And that's huge to think that periodontal treatment could reduce your risk of pneumonia. And this connection, again, between periodontitis and pneumonia is again confirmed by Nagalka et al. in another study, where they investigated the effect of bacteria in the mouth, such as F. nucleatum, P. gingivalis, and P. intermedia, um, and they, on pneumonia. And they found that Prevotella intermedia, in particular, induced very severe pneumonia in subjects who were um, compared, to with, uh, compared to those who had low levels of Prevotella. Um, and again, just these bullet points. So yes, the Prevotella does induce severe bacterial pneumonia, and it can also enhance the adhesion of pathogens, the respiratory pathogens such as virus, viruses or bacteria to the lower airway cells. And if we're trying to tie this into COVID-19, um, this research um, by Chak Kaborty was, it was fantastic. And it basically showed that in the metagenome of patients who were severely infected with SARS-CoV-2, they had really, really high levels of Prevotella, Staphylococcus, Fusobacterium, um, Villanella, and Neisseria. And these are all um, oral bacteria, which we, we find in our mouths. Um, however, they had really, really high levels in, in the severe cases of COVID-19. And so, you know, these organisms as well, we know that in increased quantities, um, they, they can indicate periodontal disease or, of course, also poor oral hygiene. And that leads me to poor oral hygiene and the increased risk of respiratory infections. So we know that a lot of the patients who are having complications from COVID-19 are over the age of 70 um, and or are vulnerable in that sense. And a lot of them are in care homes. And so a lot of work has already been done on the connection between oral health and oral hygiene and um, pneumonia. And so um, we know that, you know, pneumonia and acute viral respiratory infections are two of the most common airway infections in older patients and the greatest cause of death in patients over the age of 70. And pneumonia can be caused by numerous infectious agents. It can be caused by bacteria, mycoplasma, fungi, parasites, viruses. And a study in Japan, basically, they investigated whether oral care um, could actually reduce the incidence of pneumonia. So what they did is they split up, um, I think it was 471 patients, or 472, they split them up into two groups. Um, and half the group were given oral hygiene after every single meal by a hygienist. And the other half um, went as they usually do. And after six months, they reassessed those patients. And um, oral hygiene or oral care statistically halved um, the risk of pneumonia-related deaths in those patients who had that oral care. And that is huge to think that brushing our teeth and oral hygiene could reduce our risk of pneumonia. And you know, this isn't a one study, there's so many. So another study by Quagliero et al. Um, described oral hygiene to be the most common risk factor for pneumonia. And he found that in samples of um, branchoalveolar lavages, so that's basically the, the liquid that's inside our lungs, he found that in patients who had died from pneumonia, 
the liquid inside their lungs had um, bacteria which was from denture plaque and also from periodontal disease. And again, in particular, Prevotella was really, really high. Um, and that's really, I mean, it's crazy to think again that, you know, you were, or the, the bacteria from your denture can go all the way down to your lungs and can really impact your risk of getting pneumonia. And lastly, my favorite, favorite study out of all of these is a systematic review conducted of four randomized controlled trials. So it's, it's as golden as you get in terms of reliability and everything. Uh, it concluded that one in 10 related deaths in the elderly could be prevented had they had oral hygiene. So if we move on to just recapping everything and, and what we can do as, as the dental profession, um, what, what basically I'm trying to say is that the more severe the form of COVID-19, the higher the chance of complications such as pneumonia, sepsis, septic shock, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. And the development and the severity in, um, is, con is correlated to the risks. And um, it depends on a number of host and viral factors and this will affect the patient's immune response. And 80% of patients with COVID-19 have very mild symptoms. However, 20% of patients progress and have very severe forms of the infection, which is associated with high levels of inflammatory markers, um, high levels of bacteria, high levels of neutrophils. And the four main comorbidities associated with this increased risk of complications are also associated with altered oral, micro, uh, or, uh, altered oral biofilm and periodontal disease. And periodontal bacteria are also implicated in systemic inflammation, bacteremia, pneumonia, and also even death. And we're finding that that periodontal bacteria is present in the metagenome of patients who were severely infected with COVID-19 and unfortunately passed away. And you know, it, it's clear that bacterial superinfections are very common in patients um, in, in, you know, who were suffering from COVID-19. And you can just see that from the statistics, you know, over 80% of these patients had high bacterial loads in ICU, 74.5% of them um, required uh, antibiotics in ICU, and also the idea that treatment has shown to be successful with a dual regime of antiviral and an antibiotic. So oral hygiene should be maintained if not improved during a COVID-19 infection. And in order to reduce the bacterial load in the mouth and the risk of a bacterial superinfection, um, we really need to, to drive that home to our patients. And you know, poor oral hygiene and bacterial overgrowth can easily be transmitted um, to the lower respiratory tracts and also the lungs. And so what we recommend is that you know, oral hygiene or poor oral hygiene should be considered a risk to post-viral complication, particularly in patients who are already predisposed to altered um, biofilms due to diabetes, hypertension, or cardiovascular disease. So what can we do for our patients? Firstly, inform. So you need to inform your patients of the connection between poor oral hygiene, bacterial overgrowth, and increased risk of complications. You need to explain you know, the, the, that periodontal disease can really affect the rest of the body and can induce systemic inflammation and reduce our immune response. And basically this diagram that I made, hopefully is a bit of, it show, it has visual representation and, and can explain that. And so, you know, it's saying basically that if you have poor oral health, your oral microbiome will be altered and that will alter the um, respiratory epithelium and also the oral mucosa, which makes it more sticky and can adhere, um, you know, bacterial and viral pathogens can adhere to that. And also the whole body experiences systemic inflammation. And if that happens, then we get an increased risk of viral infections, bacterial infections and reduced immunity and this will increase our risk of complications from COVID-19. Number two, the idea of improving oral hygiene at home. Obviously we can't see our patients right now, or at least in the UK we can't. Um, so what you can advise is to, for patients to change their toothbrush head every three to four months, because there's a, a high amount of, um, of, of the virus on our toothbrushes and it, it, there's a high viral load. Um, if a patient has had COVID-19, they should change their toothbrush immediately afterwards. If you have a patient who is shielded or vulnerable, you can prescribe high fluoride toothpaste for them. And, um, and you know, this will prevent them not only of course of decay, but also you know, sensitivity and everything. And you can deliver these toothpaste. That's what I've been doing right now. And at the moment I'm actually delivering high fluoride toothpaste to, um, 
to care homes um, and it, it's all on a donation basis but basically you know we need to drive home especially to our vulnerable who are not going to be seeing for a very very long time you know how to improve their oral hygiene and, and how to basically keep them going until our doors open again interdental cleaning so we know that you know we leave approximately 30 percent of bacteria when we don't clean interdentally brushing our teeth twice a day minimum. And if you do have patients who wear dentures, to make sure that they're chemically and mechanically cleaning this every night. Um, there's this idea that you know, SLS, um, the use of a toothpaste with SLS could potentially be antiviral. Um, the, the more research needs to be done, but I thought I would add that in there, that there's a lot of people talking about, well, you know, if we have SLS in our soap and we're using the soap um, you know, when this whole pandemic started, everyone said, wash your hands, you know, wait for it to foam, wait 20 seconds. And the whole idea is that basically SLS, which is, um, in, it's called sodium lauryl sulfate, is what um, is very antiviral. And it basically pierces the lipid envelope of um, coronavirus or COVID-19 and kind of like deflates it like a balloon and makes that virus defunct. So the, the rationale behind this is, well, okay, if we have SLS in our, in our soap, we should you know, also be doing the same with our toothpaste because we also know that most toothpastes have SLS in them. Um, so you know, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot more research that needs to be done, but it, you know, it's something to bear in mind and to maybe look out for as well. And what can we do in clinic? So um, I would recommend guided biofilm therapy for all patients um, for regular removal of biofilm important to remember that the bacteria that I'm talking about is usually um, found in the state of a biofilm within the mouth and it's usually attached to the teeth and the soft tissues so it's important to remove this biofilm regularly regardless of whether or not you have gum disease um, now I'd be tempted to even reduce this recall for um, my patients um, just to make sure that their mouths are in prime condition whilst we are in the middle of this pandemic and this is what EMS recommends so for healthy teeth um, or adults and children every six months, orthodontics every three months, patients who have active periodontitis every three to four months, pregnancy every three months, and geriatrics every three to six months. And like I said, potentially you might want to reduce that recall, um, especially for those patients who you think are at an increased risk. And also um, removal of plaque retentive factors. So if you know that a patient has you know, overhangs on their fillings, they have open contact areas where plaque can really collect, then you want to try as a, you know, a dentist to really remove that um, risk factor for them. Um, you know, it's even to the point of saying, you know, if you have very crowded teeth, it might be worth even straightening them now just to make sure that you don't have a collection of biofilm and bacteria. Um, Non-surgical periodontal treatment for patients who do have periodontal disease. And if you want to know more about that, um, I follow the um, Good Practitioner's Guide by the British Society of Periodontics. So that's that little QR code on the bottom right. Um, and then also managing or removing any modifiable systemic risk factors. So if you have you know, patients who are smoking, have poor diet, who are stressed, they're drinking a lot of alcohol, or you know, they're obese, or they have diabetes, then again, trying to um, modify these risk factors or, or remove them completely. So what can we do um, in the future? What's going to be happening? So before I leave you, um, I've also been asked to discuss my research with you a little bit. Um, following on from my findings and the research that I, I published already, um, I'm now heading research with UCL Eastman, Whittington Hospital, and also the Nightingale Hospital to do the largest study on the oral microbiome and COVID-19 in the world. And we will be investigating how COVID-19 impacts the oral microbiome and whether certain bacterial strains or quantities may indicate risk of complications and mortality. And this will give us as, a dental, as dental professionals um, a leg to stand on in the future and hopefully our patients' real motivation to continue coming to the dentist. And hopefully what we're going to be seeing is that in patients who have severe cases of COVID-19, they might also have um, very high levels of oral bacteria. And we're going to be tracking that as well across um, you know, the duration of their infection. So we're going to be looking at their oral bacteria every day and seeing whether or not certain bacteria go up or down and you know, whether or not it changes. So it's super exciting and hopefully and stay tuned and we should be uh, releasing results soon. Um, and so, you know, I just wanna leave you with this message. This is how the dental industry can help in a positive way. 
And what we can do is we can basically help our population to reduce their risk of peri uh, bacterial superinfections during a COVID-19 infection and therefore reducing their complications of pneumonia, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or sepsis. And the dental industry is in a place that has never been before. Since I was a child, I was always told that being a dentist was a safe you know, job. It was a stable job or a profession, and that I would always be able to help patients no matter what. Even you know, how, no matter how hard a recession hit, how bad the world was, even if there was a war, everyone would always need a dentist and I'd always be able to help them. And I wanna remind you of this message. You know, our doors might be closed and we may feel as if we've been kind of stripped of our profession momentarily, but we're not. You can still motivate your patients and you can also prepare yourself for when your doors do open to really maintain those patients and reduce their risk as well. Um, these are all of my references, um, and um, I just uh, want to leave you with a thank you. Um, and if you do want to contact me, um, you know, for anything, you can email me, or also I have Instagram on at Dr. Victoria Sampson. So thank you. Thank you very much for this beautiful presentation. Very, very interesting also to, at some point, recap about what is actually this huge problem. I would actually uh, ask you to reshare your screen because some people oh. are asking to see <laughs> asking to see back some of the slides. So sure. we had uh, just one moment. So the first is if there is a chance to have the link to Victoria's BDJ article. Yeah. Uh, if someone wants to actually print the screen, but anyway, we are recording the this webinar, so uh, except for some catastrophic technical issues, we should be able to publish them. Okay, perfect. So we leave it there for a few seconds, and after that, I will ask you kindly to share the racial exposure chart again. The what? Sorry. The it the racial exposure chart. I guess uh, the different. Uh, mm. Interesting. <laughs> okay, never mind. So I, I mean, go. maybe the chart that I this one, maybe the last one. I guess it's someone like a geographical exposure, something like that. Um, no, yeah, nothing. Never mind. Okay. So um, very interesting. I was saying because from my point of view, I'm a general doctor, so I actually see the correlation in the dental world is always very interesting and recap with this let's say not really interesting i mean biologically very interesting but definitely a, a huge problem a virus and after all i i what i saw in italy is the fact that dentists were somehow slightly more prepared uh, than mm. uh, general doctors because they already have kind of a culture of course in sterilization protection is it again i guess also in the uk so what what's your point of view in being already kind of prepared and having to face a kind of a small evolution after all, compared to other department. I mean, you're, you're already well prepared and protected and well cultured about this. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, we have, anyone who's gotten into the dental profession um, has always had viruses and bacterial infections as a risk. You know, it's not the, the lowest risk profession and we know that. Um, you know, we, we've constant, we've always, I remember one thing that my dean always said from university was that you should treat every patient as if they have, you know, a viral infection, that they have HIV and hepatitis and they've got everything. And the reason being is that we, we can't know if a patient has an infection. So therefore our infection protocol is always very, very stringent. And we've always been very good at, at you know, keeping up with that. Um, so, I mean, you know there may be some modifications and we might have to change stuff but um generally a lot of what we're already doing should be enough for this viral infection a lot of what we're changing is because of the the public and um the way that they're you know many of them are very scared so we're trying to kind of alleviate and calm down those concerns as well so we go through some of the questions and I don't want to get too much technical about the pathogenesis, the whole uh, cytokine cascade, as long as you are not interested in eventually re-going through this because it was very complicated anyway. 
And <laughs> what is interesting, no, I mean, <laughs> we, I would like to try to keep focus on periodontal diseases at least. So, yes, yeah. um, so definitely all diseases you've shown are metabolic syndromes. Is COVID-19 fall in the same category? Like, I would say rather that this question could be asked like, do you think that COVID-19 is actually hitting harder on people with metabolic syndromes? Because of course, COVID is definitely a virus, so it cannot be classified as a metabolic syndrome, but definitely is giving worse scenario situations to patients with metabolic syndrome. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. And also, um, you know, when I say that I recommend oral hygiene or, or oral microbiome to be a risk factor, it's a risk factor that contributes. It's not, you know, the, the reason or the cause of complications. Um, so with a patient, for example, who already has a predisposing metabolic disease, um, having poor oral hygiene or periodontal disease will just increase the risk of that even more. Um, but yeah, 100%, a lot of the metabolic diseases that we've seen, they're the ones who are, you know, those patients are the ones who are being worst hit um, by COVID-19. And it's interesting to also notice that the same patient is actually very often affected by periodontal disease somehow, at least that there is kind of a correlation there is also a, a question that is basically related to the uh, fact that most of the pathogenesis and all mechanisms basically are correlated to the ch changes or status anyway of the immune system. And in fact, we basically, it's, I would say that this is definitely a correlation. Of course, uh, in this moment, it's basically like being explorer again. So as you said at the beginning of the presentation, there is nothing known and everything is under evaluation so we can just of course think about it unfortunately yeah. um, i'm trying also to as i said filter a little bit the questions because i want to stay on the periodontal um, so this is interesting but it's really more for uh, chatting, I would say, since the cytokine storm and the base of DIC is facilitated by the high level of inflammation and periodontitis 3 and 4 is a chronic inflammatory disease which rises the general inflammatory inflammation level in the body, why nobody envisions a correlation with periodontitis as a risk factor? I, I wish I knew. I mean, that's why we <laughs> are really lesson. pushing our research. Um, and I think that's why... Um, the so you know the the initial paper that I wrote it it really it, it picked up very quickly and people were really excited by it because this is um, one of the first times that people are making a link between periodontal disease and um, you know reduced immunity and the idea of increased risk of viral infections or complications um, and you know the research that we're going to be doing with the UCL hopefully will give um, you know solid advice and solid research. This will be the first of its kind to really say, look, if you have periodontal disease, you're at a much higher risk of a lot of other um, inflammatory syndromes and issues. It's definitely going to be a correlation factor anyway, um, which yeah. underlines the importance of the prevention, that's for sure, and is always more clear by time by time. So another question with chlorexidine, will chlorexidine rinse be effective against COVID? We already mentioned with the previous presentation, maybe which we can actually recap for the people that connected just recently. Um, so the, the research that has already been done has shown that chlorhexidine is not fully, um, it's, it's not fully antiviral or has, it's not very good against COVID-19. Um, if you're thinking of using chlorhexidine rinse at home on a daily basis, um, you know, I don't think there's much harm in it, but I don't think it's 100% um, protective against, um, you know, COVID-19. And that's why, you know, for example, Faye was recommending using, um, you know, uh, different in not chlorhexidine and using like pyovidine or those types of mouthwashes instead. Uh, there is a, a more in detail explanation. Maybe we can um, try again for what the, there was the chart of exposure that compared the uh, European, Black, Asians, and uh, all the other uh, ethnicity and ethnies. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Perfect. There you go. Oh, oh my. There you go. I Perfect. think that's what Thanks. he means. I, I guess. So yes, definitely. Should be this one at least. 
Okay, um, so I, there are many interesting questions actually, but honestly, they are about genetics, they're about correlations. <laughs> so it's not really like the, the right place to go through this kind of question because it would really be just about literally uh, talking really about it, unfortunately. So um, any basic advice or how do you picture the dentist in this moment, in this area, in the management? Of the COVID-19? Do you think that the dentist can have some important role in the scouting for patient, in for spotting for potential dangerous patients and eventually play a, a key role factor maybe? This is my question of course. Um, I Yes, I mean um, before COVID-19 I would always like I, I was always quite nosy and whenever I was, I was looking at a patient I'd always think like oh you know they're maybe their mucosa looks a little bit funny or they they keep on getting, um, you know, infections. And, you know, in my opinion, everything is related and our mouth is very linked to the rest of our body. And there have been numerous times where I've told patients like, you know, you're constantly getting ulcers. You should go and have a blood test. You need to check this out. Um, so I do think that, you know, or I hope that post COVID people are going to understand that our mouth is not a completely separate entity to the rest of our body. Um, and as a dentist, we can play a very important role, um, not only because we're, we regularly are seeing patients, which means that we can kind of track them and see what's going on with them. And, you know, if you're seeing like a, a massive change in, in their weight or in, you know, if their lymph nodes or something like that, you know, it's quite easy for you to just be able to track those patients and see what's going on. But also we're in a position where we can... Um, you know, changing your toothbrush and brushing your teeth twice a day and, and having your, your hygiene and your checkup regularly, it's something so easy and small and simple and can actually have a huge impact. And my concern um, is that post COVID, and I've heard from some patients, they say, oh, I'm scared of coming to the dentist. What happens if, you know, you guys might have lots of viruses in your room? And unfortunately, there's been some um, very poor media on that as well. And you know, like we said earlier, we've always been exposed to viruses and bacteria, and we've always been able to fight them well and, and be protected. Um, so it's really important to drive home to our patients that not only, you know, we've always had this as an issue, and, and because it's been like this for hundreds of years, we've been able to create very stringent hygiene protocols, um, but also that they need to continue coming to the dentist, and this is not the time to be abandoning their oral care because they're scared of um, contracting coronavirus on our chair because if anything we're helping them we're not we're not actually making them more at risk definitely actually it's more risky probably to go to the general doctor because as i said at least i'm talking by my experience we we didn't have all this culture in protection so mm. and we of course had to evolve and we had to do a lot more steps than what a dentist mm -hmm. had done so thank you very much again for your beautiful presentation my and, pleasure uh, We've got a few minutes before the next one, so we're going to take a quick break and I'm going to stop your screen. So, okay, eventually, thank you very much again. Before